Okay, good evening. Yeah, it's evening for me. This is recording for the lecture for the class Korean Government and Politics for the class that should meet June 3rd, Thursday, Jan June 3rd. But due to coronavirus instances on campus, we're not able to meet this week in our regular classes so I'm doing a recording now uh, before we dive in too deep let's just quickly take a look at the overview and if you do you'll notice that the lecture notes and readings are not in the current week display that's because I actually set this up two weeks ago so you'll find the materials in week 10 but if we go back to where we were first of all we can see that for the lecture of May 31st which was Monday and I said to read it Monday Tuesday or to watch the video Monday Tuesday or Wednesday well it's 10 50 p.m. on Wednesday right now I asked you to watch it by Wednesday night so two people have watched it and five people have not that's where we are that's how the semester is going anyway uh, if we look here, we can find a few things. One is homework due June 4th. That would be Friday. Homework sent to me through the email system at rjdickey at kmu.ac.kr. Your homework is to collect a list of free trade agreements signed by South Korea or currently in negotiations. Currently in negotiations. <clears throat> the last time I looked, a couple hours ago, I had not received any homework. All right. <clears throat> Note on the recorded lecture. Mm -hmm. And a note on finishing the semester. Okay, this is extensive. Due to the COVID cases across several different colleges on our campus, we're not able to have face-to-face -face classes. So we're only finishing the semester with distance classes, remote classes. This here is the video, the recorded lecture for Thursday. You must watch it by Sunday night. There will be a recorded lecture for Monday, June 7th. You must watch it by Wednesday night. Thursday, June 14th, our regular Thursday class meeting. You might say, the semester is over. No, this is an official school makeup, an official bogan for May 20th. We are going to do Zoom on June 20th because that's the chance for you to ask questions. It's our final class, it's our review to prepare for the final exam. So the recorded lectures for Thursday, June 3rd, Monday, June 7th, these will be available not later than noon of the lecture day. And then you have several more days to watch it. The final test is a take-home test. It's scheduled for May 21st. That's the official school schedule. But again, we're not having any face-to-face -face sessions. Okay, the 21st seems really late, but that's the school schedule for non-departmental classes. I'm sorry, it's really late. But you don't have to be that late. It is 
an online class. I will put the test up on this CTL, this eboard, after our review, a day or two after our review. I'm not promising just yet. We'll talk in the Zoom. But it will come up here, and you must turn it in not later than Monday night, May 21st. I say 11.55 p.m. because that's convenient. Midnight is confusing. Okay. Guys, my tests are difficult. You saw the midterm. It wasn't easy. It's going to take time. It's kind of a fusion, kind of a mix between a report on an assigned topic and a test. You can't sit down and do this take-home test in an hour. If you haven't been doing all the reading and keeping up, it's going to take you four or five hours. You're going to have to go through and find things, find information. Okay? So, don't plan that you can sit down on uh, Monday evening May 21st and knock it out in an hour. It's not easy. Plan for this test. You need to do readings. You need to pay attention in the videos. If you just kind of halfway watch the video, you want to go back and watch it again maybe. You want to join the Zoom and ask questions. Okay, here's the information for the Zoom. It's a link. You've done Zoom before. This is a direct link. It should open up easily. If you have any problems, there's the meeting ID. There's the password. All right. So, public diplomacy. Let's move this over. We don't need all that now. So I made a note here that this might be rescheduled. It was originally scheduled for the week before. There's two primary readings and a few more things. But before we go too much further, let's talk about two key words. Polycentrism And status or statism. Okay, so statism comes from the word state. State does not mean uh, a smaller part of a big country like California is a state in the United States, California Jew. Uh, New South Wales is a state in Australia. Switzerland has states, they call them cantons. Germany has states. That's not the kind of state we're talking about. Historically, those words, those, those subunits or smaller parts of bigger countries at one point in time, they thought of themselves as independent countries. So when we talk about the status, we're using a word sovereign. S O V E R E I. G N and you can see that I can't write with a pen. That's a V. Sovereign. Sovereign means that it is basically independent. Yeah. We did this many weeks ago. Sovereign means basically independent. They don't have to ask somebody else for permission. Korea in 1860 had some independence, but they also were under the control of China. We can call that suzerain. Suzerain. Another word we talked about many weeks ago. Right? 
Korea sent money, slave workers, women, food to China. Korea couldn't have an independent foreign policy. They had to get permission from China. That was 1860s. Japan and Russia and China had a series of wars in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, 1900, 1905. Japan won all those wars. Well, Russia was trying to protect its east coast, like Vladivostok, and they claimed a bunch of islands to the north of Japan, and they also wanted to have more influence over China. China, of course, wanted to keep its power over Korea and wanted to keep its independence as much as it could. But ultimately, Japan won basically everything. And so Korea, instead of sending gold and women and slaves to China in 1860, by 1890, the Japanese army was sitting in Seoul and giving <clears throat> advice advice to the king of Korea and soon after we called it the Emperor of Korea that was kind of a political choice trying to say hey we're really independent but uh, well we know what happened between 1905 and 1915 Korea lost all of its sovereignty and became a colony so it went from a suzerain of China a formal suzerain to a semi-formal, not quite official suzerainty of Japan to a colony of Japan. That Korea lost all sovereignty, whereas before it had some. All right, so the statist approach suggests that the central government, the government that manages a defined land, Okay. We call it a country. The, the land that we find on a map marked as yours. That government of a defined land or country is a state. They have some sovereignty. And so a statist approach means that government is making the decisions. What's good for the country? That decision is made by a king or by an emperor. Or, well, something like that. And kind of the opposite of that would be a polycentric approach. And a polycentric approach, or polycentrism, means there's not one center, there's not one state making the choices, but there are many actors. So there are many centers, and these various centers all have influence. So this question becomes important when we're talking about public diplomacy, because public diplomacy, as we said in the previous lecture, is something more than traditional lecture, which was statist or state-centered, where the, the central government made all the choices. But public diplomacy suggests that there are more actors who have more freedom. They're not just following instructions of the central government. The government can give advice, the government can give money, uh, but the government understands that there are other actors that can promote a benefit for the country if we let them. So polycentrism is more consistent with, more connected to the idea of a public diplomacy where there isn't one central government. Okay, we mentioned these kinds of things last class. Let's jump into one of the readings. Now, the maybe most theoretical, most boring, but it has a couple of key points, would be this article by uh, Ma Song and Moore. I mentioned it in the last lecture. Let's take a look. Ma Song more. Korea's public diplomacy, a new initiative 
for the future. And we can see the date mark on this is December 2012. This is almost like a blog. Uh, they call it an issue brief. That is, it's a short paper. It's not quite too scholarly. Uh, it's not quite too factual. But it is uh, coming out of an organization that is supportive of the government, okay? the Asan Institute for Political Studies. And it's a nice start. So let's just take a look at the abstract first. The 21st century has shown that public diplomacy is an important part of a country's international strategy, public diplomacy. The traditional hard powers of military and economic might, economic power, military power, are no longer enough, no longer sufficient for a nation to further its national interest. We need more than guns and money. Adding in public diplomacy, by combining public diplomacy, which is based on soft power assets, combining that with traditional diplomacy, a nation, a country, can achieve its goal of improving, enhancing its national image. That will allow it, that will make it able to increase its influence in a way that the world will look favorably. The world will say, oh, that's good. Okay? Public diplomacy is a new concept in Korea, officially launched in 2010. And while in 2012 and still even today, public diplomacy programs don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of staff, don't have a lot of resources, and various different departments and sections in the country overlap and conflict, that is, they are redundant. They duplicate each other. Legislators politicians and policy makers that could be not elected but uh, inside the ministries are beginning to understand the importance of public diplomacy programs. Tools that Korea has include growing popularity of Korean music, Korean dramas, Korean films, and the fact that Korea has the reputation of being the most wired country in the world. There's no doubt that Korea has the best internet connectivity. Whether you're using your smartphone or you're using a computer, Korea's internet connection is ubiquitous. That was a popular word. It's everywhere and it's fast. Now the websites are not always great. They can be very difficult to work even for Koreans very cumbersome and they demand a lot of data they're very they're filled with pop-ups and videos and stuff that people in other countries can't watch you know it's it's slow when you try to see a Korean website when you're in Vietnam but the fact that Korea has this technology everybody knows it it's good and of course not only the most wired internet connectivity but some of the best tools smartphones computers Korea's quite gifted and the world knows that okay so the argument is that effective public policy requires partnerships with civil society okay polycentrism not ordering civil society but partnership and a partnership should be equal or nearly equal so that means civil society social groups NGOs churches they have to have freedom to make choices and sometimes the choice isn't exactly what government wants but that's their freedom okay so Korea is forming these partnerships and has developed some significant programs. All right, let's move forward. We, we saw this word before, hearts and minds of foreigners. Korea seeks to win the hearts and minds of foreigners. Anyway, so to make this work, to further strengthen public diplomacy, better coordination is needed. 
Okay, coordination doesn't mean control. Korea loves this word, control tower. But it means coordination where uh, if there is a central organization, they don't have power, they're just the, like, the information hub. It's not the top of the hierarchy, okay? It's not the top of the hierarchy. It's not the peak and everybody is below it. It's not like this. But instead, it's a kind of a hub and everybody is connecting. Nobody has more power. Now, the hub, if the hub has money, the hub could send money out to encourage people to connect back in. But this organization over here might decide to do their own thing. This organization decides to not coordinate. There's an organization out here that's doing their own thing and they don't even have a clue. They're not connected at all. This one at least is kind of in the general area but this is way out here but they're doing things that they think are good for korea okay so uh the argument is there needs to be better coordination not command not command but coordination and in order to do that it is essential to lay a strong foundation a healthy foundation we need to put a good base in that means budget, money, staffing, manpower, and organization, coordination. Okay. Furthermore, Korea needs to enhance its public awareness campaigns. It needs to improve in order to boost civil society's participation. They need to talk to more civil society organizations and say, we want you in. What do you need? Okay. Now here he argues that 9-11, when the terrorists drove airplanes into buildings in America, that was a major shock. That was the true beginning of the 21st century, not January 1, 2000, or January 1, 2001, depending which way you want to argue it. Uh, that wasn't really different from the year 1999, but 9-11 changed the world. 9-11 okay. showed that traditional diplomacy wasn't enough and we're going to have to do things differently. So 9-11, not only did it expose the limits of traditional diplomacy, not only did 9-11 show its problems, but globalization, IT, and the changing political situation, for example, in the Middle East, continues to push the world into a new world, a new environment where traditional diplomacy is not sufficient. That's what they say. Is it true? Well, uh, this class is not an international relations class. We're just going to try to look at Korea's role. All right, so let's, we've already talked about a lot of this. Let's move on to a section that's interesting. Korea's soft power resources. Here we argue that Korea has a lot a lot of soft power resources. And they start by saying, even though Korea is known as the miracle of the Han, Korea has limited hard power assets. Yeah, Korea's army is mostly focused at North Korea, right? Korea's money has been mostly focused inside Korea. That's the tradition. Korea's soft power probably really began with the 88 Olympics and uh, with the expansion of Korean technology to the world, originally Hyundai cars and Samsung TVs and, and Gold Star, before it became LG, uh, TVs were known as cheap junk. Japan had good stuff, Korea had junk. That was in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. But by the end of the 90s, as we turn to the 21st century, Samsung was making excellent phones. LG was making great TVs. Hyundai cars were getting a better and better reputation. We started to see Korean videos playing in other countries. We started hearing about K-pop music in other countries. 
just starting. And so that's when the soft power, when, when people in Vietnam were starting to say, oh, Korean, I bought, a, I bought a, a Samsung air conditioner. Yeah, it's a little bit cheaper than the Japanese, but it's quite good. And maybe part of what made Korea better known as good was because China was coming into the market with cheap junk. And Korea was no longer known as cheap junk. Korea was known as good stuff. Okay, maybe it's not a BMW or a Lexus, but it's good stuff. And that was just at the turn of the century. And in the 20 years since then, Korea's reputation has gotten better and better and better. Korea's chips, semiconductor chips, LG TV monitors, LG screens are the world best. No maybe, LG screens are the best. Samsung uh, cell phones are recognized as as good as it gets, right? I mean, there's Apple and there's Samsung. If you don't want to be stuck in the Apple world, I don't, then Samsung's probably the best choice. Is Apple better than Samsung? Well, it's a trade-off. When you go to Apple, you give up some freedoms, you give up some things. So, uh, we don't need to argue which is better. In the Android environment, Samsung is as good as it gets. Nobody makes it better. Right? So when we're looking at public diplomacy, we need to talk about soft power. And one of that soft power is simply the fact that Korea is now famous for climbing up from the ashes, from a basket case, a failure to now. Okay, this is the same story we've been talking about before, but now we're using that success story for a way for Korea to influence other countries by saying, look, we did it, let's show you how. Okay. Korea has the distinction of thus far, so far, being the only country to move from being an aid recipient to an aid donor. Korean companies are global players. 13 of the top 500 are Korean companies. Hallyu is a soft power. Hallyu is more than music, movies, and television dramas. Sports, they say. Well, you know, Korea's done very well in the Olympics. Speed skating, pretty good in the soccer, right? So, uh, baseball. Korea is doing quite well in sports. That's a kind of soft power. Uh, this is old, right? It says Jisung Park. Who's who's the guy now playing in, in England? Like, Korea has good soccer. Sporting events. These are all the kinds of things we've heard of before. So we're, we're talking about how you being Korean culture, the Korean wave, more than just the, the, the video and song, but things that people associate with Korea. And that includes Korean food. Now, Everybody talks about kimchi, but a lot of people don't really love kimchi, but they love bulgogi, right? So, uh, foreign languages, Korean's becoming a little bit more popular. There's more universities around the world. There are the King Sejong Institutes that are in uh, 60 countries. There's like 90, something like that. More than I think there's more than 100 now. King Sejong Institutes around the world where people go to study Korean language. Hanbok, IT. So, all these technologies have allowed the government to start using more and more social media. Now, are they doing a good job? That's a different question. Uh, government is always a little slow. You know, they don't have the ability to bring in the. 22 to 27 year old uh, YouTube stars that's just that's just not how government works uh, they might be able to bring in a few consultants but yeah they're always going to be a little behind but they're, they're trying they're working uh, within Korea social media is very important and and the ministries can can uh, work with local stars but internationally it's a little bit harder education as a soft power tool 
you know, here at our university, we have quite a lot of foreign students. Korea has the world's highest education enrollment rate, something like 90, close to 90% of people who are 21 years old are in university. Something like that, pretty close. Uh, and if we add junior college, it's more like 93, 94%. Hogwans, all that. So people are coming to Korea to study. Uh, here they talk about filial piety. That's the, the respect for your father and your mother and your, and your ancestors. That seems to be fading. I'm not sure if that's as true in the year 2020 as it was in the year 2010. And I'm not sure how that works uh, for public diplomacy. I, that's a strange argument. Uh, oriental medicine. Hanyak. It's a little bit different in Korea than other places. And it's getting a lot more well known around the world as being distinct. Korean traditional medicine versus the Taiwan style, which is also very well known. Uh, Chinese style, of course, but around the world, Chinese style is not so well known because, of course, it was hard to go to China. All right. So, how do we engage public diplomacy? Well, this article says we need to get people inside Korea involved. The domestic actors. We need to get people inside Korea involved. Non-government actors and local government actors. Here it says, private activities of citizens, corporations, NGOs, and media. Each of these organizations has their own strengths and their own interests, and we can use those to improve Korea's brand. And if people think well of Korea, then when Korea wants something, maybe they have a little more luck, a little more ability to get people to agree. All right, I'm going to go to the bottom here. The current status, well, that's current status 2012. That's not where we want to be. We're going down to national image. I said national brand, okay? If I say Rolex, in your mind, you know the brand Rolex and the image is wow expensive watch must be good BMW Mercedes Benz these are very good images now let me say uh, a country like uh, Mozambique if you think of Mozambique you might be thinking of pirates, you know, poverty, children who are hungry. Now that's not the case for everyone and everything in Mozambique, but it's an image that comes to mind. It's a poor country. We want to develop the best possible image. So our national brand or our national image. So the United States they try to push that idea of democracy, hard work, human rights, and freedom. Although Donald Trump has uh, somehow weakened some of the human rights concepts, although he pushed the hard work and the freedom concepts. So, you know, these things, they're always moving, always changing. Japan tries to say that we are anti-war. Germany, same. Okay. Uh, New Zealand is famous for clean and green. They say Australia and New Zealand. Especially New Zealand is famous for clean and green. New Zealand's known for no nuclear. No nuclear power, no nuclear weapons. But um, creating a positive national image is difficult. A lot of things can go wrong. Uh, and it could be something the government does, it could be what people do. Americans were kind of known as ugly Americans after the 1940s. When Americans went traveling in the 1950s, it's like, well, I have money, I can do anything. And it made people upset. And 
Korea had that problem in the 1990s. Korean people went, especially businessmen, would go to other countries, poorer countries like Southeast Asia, and, oh, we've got money, we're, we're an advanced country, and, and they made Korea look bad. So Korea has used the slogans of Global Korea and Dynamic Korea to try to create positive images. Uh, how well did they work? Well, I don't know. The I, th I thought the Dynamic Korea had uh, a good influence in that it really showed uh, the music and the IT. It did a good job. Global Korea, I don't know that it did very much. And we've heard of other things. Uh, here in Daegu, if you remember long ago, they used to call it Milano East. It was an idea of, uh, that Daegu was a, a fashion city. And I think that's what we're going to stop here. Conclusion, uh, Korea is beginning its own public diplomacy programs. That was 12, uh, eight years ago. The rich supply of soft power assets will equip it for a successful journey. Okay, There are lots of soft power as assets. It's just a matter of organizing, coordinating, including citizens. When citizens travel abroad, they have to think, I'm a diplomat. Okay, so that is a very broad, wide-ranging introduction by Ma Song Moon. We're going to close that one. And I actually like this one. It's more fun. Okay, it's a from a a soft magazine. It's it's a kind of almost scholarly magazine. It says riding the Korean wave. And I think of like like uh, surfing. You know, the, the, the wave is there. It can knock you down. But if you've got the right equipment, a surfboard, and you have the right technique, you can ride that wave and have a good time and impress people. So we've got these Korean assets. How can we use them? Let's ride the Korean wave from Gangnam Style to Global Recognition. Okay, Talking about soft power. So. Uh, how should uh, how do we link traditional diplomacy and public diplomacy so we've been talking so far about these are separate things how can we link them we're not saying traditional diplomacy goes away we're adding we're supplementing and how can we use the private sector individuals and businesses and NGOs how can we use all the energy they have to improve the the image, the brand of South Korea. Okay, how can Korea influence the world? Oops. Korea has never been an empire, even though there was uh, ten years or so when they called it the Korean Empire. It's always been relatively weak. The, you know, the shrimp between two whales. It always was a weak nation in poverty, and this page is a little formatted a little interestingly. It was in poverty after independence. Okay, we know this history. But this guy says, to tell the truth, I was the one I was one of those who was cynical about the Korean wave. Cynical's like yeah, it's not going to work. That's a bunch of nonsense. Everybody's talking about it, but it's not real. Okay, he says that there was a feeling that it was dangerous, that people might reject it. People might think, oh, it's just a show. It's just a mirror. It's just a mirage. You know, the water you see in the desert when you get there is not real. And this guy says he was also worried about arrogance. He's like, yeah, we're the best. Uh, that Koreans might get too proud. But he changed his mind. He says, after seeing flash mobs pop up in Europe and South America, I became convinced that the Korean wave is driven by Global Village. Flash mobs is really a Korean phenomenon. It, it came out of Korea. 